On August 28, 2020, there was a letter published to adoptaninmate.org from a prisoner on death row. To whom it may concern, my name is Brandon Daniel, and I am writing this letter to you from prison. With police brutality once again in the news and legal reform a hot topic of discussion, I'm writing to tell you about my legal case, in the hope that I might be able to spread awareness about a common but little known condition that is responsible for sending others to prison and perhaps to leverage your platform to gain support as well. My case involves the class of anti-anxiety medication called benzodiazepines, and it is one of the clearest examples of something called paradoxical reaction. I am hoping that you can help me. Let me fill you in on my story. First, my background is relevant because it demonstrates that the event that led to my being here was not a pattern of behavior. I have no violence in my past, no felonies. I was a software engineer, I'm college educated, and I'm from a normal middle class home. The event took place at Walmart, so it was all captured on surveillance videos. A police officer was called and he confronted me, tackled me, and in the chaos of the moment, I shot and killed him. The video shows how hectic the situation was. It clearly was not a thought out and intentional act. It took place in the span of 10 seconds. Subsequent blood tests revealed that I had 11 times the therapeutic dose of Xanax in my system, and these tests were taken 7 hours after the event. The public opinion surrounding my case was continuously manipulated by statements released from the pharmaceutical company. In many news articles, the fact that I was even on Xanax at all is never mentioned. I have learned that this is a common tactic used by the pharma industry, who often deploy crash teams to these types of events to try and shift the blame away from their drugs. I was convicted and sent to Texas death row, where I am today. Since my trial, my lawyers and I have accumulated a massive amount of research proving that this is not a one-off event, but is a well-known phenomenon in the medical community that has been actively covered up by the pharmaceutical industry for decades. I have scientific articles, expert evaluations, and even an internal FDA study that highlights the extreme number of violent episodes associated with benzodiazepines compared to other drugs. Now, my goal is to use my story to help expose this issue. Books have been written about pharmaceutical-induced violence, but I really feel that my case is the clearest example of such an event. My friends and family have compiled information about my case on a website, supportbrandondaniel.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, Brandon Daniel. The justice system is not perfect because it relies upon humans in every step of the way. Humans can and do make mistakes. This is well documented throughout history. So, a letter like this should be given the attention to detail it deserves. Brandon Daniels' overall message from this letter seems to be that his case was manipulated and somehow unjust. The website goes into even more detail and research about benzodiazepines and is clear about the goal. Let's go back and see things for ourselves. Shortly after midnight on April 6, 2012, a Walmart employee made a call to 911. The Walmart employee is referring to then 24-year-old Brandon Daniel, who appears to be heavily intoxicated. The Walmart employee made the call because he was afraid that Brandon would leave the Walmart and drive his vehicle while being under the influence. Brandon also happened to shoplift various food items and put them into his backpack. Officer Jaime Padron soon arrived on the scene. Officer Padron called out to Brandon, but Brandon ignored him and made his way to the Walmart exit. 
Brandon attempted to flee the Walmart, but Officer Padron tackled him to the ground. While on the ground, Brandon shot Officer Padron in the neck with a gun that was concealed in his pocket. Brandon was disarmed by the Walmart employee who originally made the call and held until more police arrived. Officer Padron was soon pronounced dead. Brandon was arrested and taken in for questioning. Can you show me to my that I'm talking to you? That's it, true enough. Okay. So from what I understand, you're, you're living over there at the Waters Park apartment, you were saying? Yes, ma'am. And this incident happened kind of close to there? Yes. Okay. What was going on today? Were you out earlier in the night doing something? Uh, I had some drugs. Okay, what kind of drugs? I had taken those that night. Is that something that you normally take at night? No, I've done it two or three times. Was this with like a, a roommate or a group of people, or was it just you on your own? Just me on my own. Brandon just admitted to voluntarily taking Xanax. This is important, and we will revisit this moment later. And how, how big was the Xanax, I guess? Four bars. Four bars? Is that when you have taken it before? Is that a normal amount? Yeah. And they take about two bars. Oh, you normally take two? So it's a little bit more than usual. What time was that around? Uh, well, I thought it was 11 p.m., so I don't know, like 9 p.m. 9 p.m.? Okay. And then, and then what happened? And then, uh, <laughs> I uh, decided to go to, uh, on a ride on my motorcycle. You know, I was thinking very clearly. And I um, went to the Walmart and I uh, decided to shoplift a bunch of uh, items. And uh, on the way out, a cop saw me and I panicked and, and I pulled my gun out and shot him. Okay. Usually in an interrogation, the objective is to get the suspect to confess to the crime at hand. But here, the detective did not react to the blatant confession because the event was captured by surveillance and that footage is likely enough to convict Brandon of murder to any jury. Therefore, Brandon's confession means nothing to the detective. Instead, she's mainly interested in deciphering whether this is a case of murder or capital murder. There is a subtle yet important difference between the two. In the state of Texas, a person commits the offense of murder if they intentionally or knowingly cause the death of an individual. A person commits the offense of capital murder when the person murders a police officer who is acting in the lawful discharge of an official duty. It's important to note that to be guilty of capital murder, the person must have known that the victim was a police officer. The reason this matters is that in the state of Texas, the punishment for capital murder can be the death penalty, while the maximum penalty for murder is life in prison. Therefore, if she can establish that Brandon knew the victim was a police officer prior to what transpired, Brandon can potentially face the death penalty. What kind of gun? It was uh, 380. 380? Is that something you normally carry on you? Um. From time to time, because I've gotten threats before. Threats? I've um, worked as an as, uh, informant in different situations. For? For uh, Douglas County in Colorado. Tecos? Te Tecos, is that you think, County? Uh, Douglas County. Douglas County, okay. <laughs> so because of some past. Uh, things that have come up with being informant or past situations in Colorado, I mean, you can't carry the 380? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you've lived here for about a year and a half? For about a year and a half. I also uh, did, um, I worked for Larimer County uh, Drug Task Force. Larimer? Both. Okay. And is that in Colorado as well? Correct. Is that an, as an informant? Yes, ma'am. Larimer County and then Douglas County? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Are you, you're not wanted out of Colorado? No, ma'am. Okay. So you left under good standing in Colorado? Yes, ma'am. You did your, you were an informant, everything's fine, and then you just got a job here, so you came here? Yes, I've run down one drug dealer who has been uh, a main drug dealer for uh, 
uh, that did almost him. And apparently it was a fairly big bust. In Colorado? In Colorado. Okay, so. and then they wanted you to get out of town because of it, or what? Um, yeah, well, I was about to graduate from college, and then I got a job offer here in Austin, so I moved down here. And which, uh, which company do you work for? You the Packard. Okay, so I'm working here, and you've been looking over and on with the water department at Palmer and Mopac. Do you yes, have a roommate or anything? I do. Okay, was he pushing home tonight? Um, he's gone and he's off and gone. Uh, I, I don't know who he is. Okay. There. So you get off of work? Yes. And you do anything special like to work? Um, watch TV and, and smoke weed. Okay. So is, is weed a normal, is a normal thing you do? Weed's my only thing that I do. For a normal type of drug? Correct. Okay. So you smoke weed, watch TV, and then at some point you decided to... At some point, my friend said that he had some bars and, and uh, he gave me some. So there was a, there was a buddy with you? Uh, he called me up. He called me on the cell phone, told me he had some bars. Okay, so was he just a supplier or is he a buddy? He is a buddy. The buddy. Did he come on over? Yes, he did. Okay. Did he take him with you? Um, no. Okay, how did that work out? Uh, he sold me four, and I, and I gave him the cash, and then he smoked a little uh, weed with me, and then left. How many did you bars before? Um, these were six piece. Six, twelve, so twenty-four. For six bucks? Yes, usually they're five bucks a piece. Was this more expensive for any particular reason? Um, sometimes when there's a shortage, there's more. Okay. And um, the guy with the body is with you. And what's his name? Um, I don't want to incriminate him. Okay. Um, so you had him, you smoked with him, and what time did he leave? The detective should be commended. The suspect is never interrupted, comfortable, and revealing important information. This dynamic is important because it establishes rapport and is infinitely more productive towards gathering information in comparison to intimidation. Her attempt at trying to get his friend's name was delivered smoothly and indirectly. Um, so you had him, you smoked with him, and what time did he leave? Even though her attempt failed, the delivery was hard to beat, and she immediately recovered and continued questioning. The fact that Daniel recognized the attempt and rejected incriminating his acquaintance shows he is at least somewhat intellectually present. This is notable because he is supposedly intoxicated on a multitude of different substances during this point. Um, shortly after uh, 6.30, but so it's still a light out. Correct. Okay. So after 6 30 p.m., what did you end up doing? And then um, the Xanax makes you lose your memory really badly. And, um, and then I, I, I uh, took the bike out. And you're talking about a motorcycle. Motorcycle. Oh, what kind of motorcycle do you have? It's a Kawasaki CX10. And where, where did you go? Where did you invite you? Uh, first, I just rode around and, and uh, I saw Walmart. And, uh, Is this the Walmart, like right, right at Palmer and 35? Or where, which Walmart are we talking about? Um, shoot. <coughs> I didn't have to watch Palmer and 35. I mean, did you go like great distance when you were driving? Or? I did go great distance, but I circled around some, and it's uh, very difficult to piece it together. Okay. It was, a, it was a Walmart, and then you kind of circled back, and it might have been near your residence somewhere? Correct. Okay. Do you know what time you got there? Uh, it's hard to recall. 8 or 8.30. Was it just gotten dark? Just now. Okay, and then what did you do in the Walmart? Um, in the Walmart, I went in and looked for things that I needed. Um, I got them all in bags. I had a backpack with me. Then when I saw that there were no uh, cameras, I put them in the back of my backpack. You put them in like the Walmart bags and then you put them in the back of your backpack? Yes. 
and then I proceeded to walk out. When I walked out, I saw one officer and one plainly closed um, loss prevention associate. Um, the officer told me to stop, and I knew what he was after. And I had a three in my pocket, so I figured that the uh, um, consequences might be worse. So I ran. The car grabbed me, and, um, and I turned around and, and shot him. Okay, so you had it, you're, the gun in like the front pocket? Or front pocket. Like the right or the left? The right pocket. So you just plainly carry it, like just hide it in the pocket? Yes. Okay, and then you're talking about these pants that you're wearing now? These pants that you're wearing now. Okay, is so that in the right front pocket? Yes, ma'am. So when you, when you came out of the, you came out of one of the main doors at the Walmart? Yes, ma'am. So they were kind of just sitting there talking? Uh, the officer and the loss prevention guy? They were eyeballing me, so they knew that they were going to confront me. And the officer said, what in your words? The officer said, uh, will you please step next to me? Will you please follow me? And, and then I took off running. Just any particular direction? I went towards the exit. Okay, so this was still inside the store? Yes, ma'am. They kind of approached you before you, you hit those doors to go outside? Yes, ma'am. Okay. How far did you get when you were running? Four or five feet. And then what did the officer do? He grabbed me and uh, I turned around and saw uh, his face and I shot him. He just grabbed you from behind? He grabbed my arm and um, my right arm was loose and the still had the gun. So you grabbed your left arm? He grabbed my left arm and shoulder. Okay, so you're running and he grabbed you like up here? This one. And you kind of, so you kind of turned? So I turned around, yes. But this, this hand was already free, the right hand? That one was free, and once he started to uh, talk to me, uh, I had my hand in my pocket okay. ready to go. So the minute you saw him, you were kind of like, oh, I know where this is going. Well, the two guys talking. Well, I figured if I could escape, then I wouldn't have avoided the situation, but uh, I guess premeditated, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Now you had a gun on you and, and everything, you were just like, oh, I need to get, I need to get out of here because this charge is going to be even worse. Correct. So while they were kind of confronting you, you put your hand in your right pocket. Correct. Okay. And then while you were fleeing, you kind of just kept your hand in or you just pulled the gun out right away? Or... Well, it's like I pulled it out right away. Okay. And we're talking four or five steps. Yes, ma'am. So then you grab, he gets the shoulder, and when you turn, him, his face is kind of like right there. Um, yes, it was kind of a jumble until I turned around and I saw a clear shot of his face. And so then you're the guns in your right hand. Yes, ma'am. You didn't, did you need to pull it up? Or yes, shoot it from your hip? Or? I pulled it up directly to his face. Right to his face? Correct. How far away were you from like me to you right now with my. I am. How far away? That's about the perfect distance. From you to him? Yes, ma'am. And then you shot him? Yes, ma'am. Okay, where did you shoot him? Um, it was hard to tell, but I believe square in the face. Square in the face? Yes, ma'am. Okay, how many times did you fire? One. And then what happened? And then the other officers tackled me, and uh, it was over. There was more than one uh, uniform officer, or are you talking about like, the loss prevention officer? I, I believe it was loss prevention. All I said it was one officer who was down. One officer was down? Um, one officer who I shot was down. She had a little in his face. And then you got tackled. Yeah. Was, you know, not, you know, do you remember somebody in uniform tackling you, or just somebody tackling you? Um, just tackled and then uh, it was kind of a blur at that point. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about what happened? I feel like my life's over. <laughs> and was your 380 was it loaded completely to capacity? It was fully loaded with one in the chamber. Is that how you have it? Hot? Yes, ma'am. Is that how you normally carry it? That's not how I normally carry it, but um, when I went to the store, I didn't want to be you know, cocking it if something was going to happen, you know. So you just got it ready just in case? I got it ready, yeah. 
Uh, so you're pretty much uh, like ready to go from the beginning. I mean, you went over there. And you, you had the intention of shoplifting. I had the intention of shoplifting. I did not have the intention of shooting anybody. You got the gun ready just in case there was an issue. I got it. correct. And how do you feel, like right now, as we're talking, how do you feel about shooting that cop? I feel horrible. I and mean, I, I feel... I, I deserve it. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, do you feel horrible for yourself because your life is over? I feel very bad for the officer who is doing his job and his kids and... And I saw his face, and, uh... What did, what did his face look like when you saw him? Um... There was blood, like, coming in. There was blood coming out of his eyes, and... And, uh... Is he saying anything? He was... He was gurgling. This next moment is the most important part of the interrogation. Pay attention to the sharp and seemingly innocent question that the detective asks. And when you first saw him, when he first, you know, when he turned around and he turned to you, did, I mean, did he say anything to you at that point? I don't think he could say anything. He, uh, he could just barely gurgle. This is when you saw him on the ground? Yes. Okay. When you when you ran your four or five steps and he and he got you know, he kind of grabbed your shoulder and he turned around. Did he have time to say something to you? Did he get anything out? Did you hear him yelling at you while you were kinda of taking your steps to run away? When I first ran, he said I'm a cop. And then there was four steps where uh, three or four people were screaming and I couldn't decipher. Uh, who said which? And what, say the, the three or four people who were screaming, what were they screaming? They were screaming, stop, um, this loss prevention, lost police, or um, this police officers, things like that. Okay, so he said, I want you to step over here, you know, blah, 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 and then when he started to run, he said, I'm a cop. That's yes, Okay. And then as you're taking your four or five steps to run away, you hear just a jumble screaming of loss <laughs> prevention, stop, you know, police officer or whatever. Yeah, and acceleration to just, yeah. You, know. you hear people like yeah. four steps behind you or something? Yeah, it was just a blur, kind of. And when he, when he grabbed you to turn you around, did he say anything at that, that particular moment? Um, no, that was more fast-paced. It was, uh... Just a wrestle more. And a, a pull? He, he pulled me and my body jerked. You know. And then you got to run up? And, and then what time are you talking about? Like a second at the most? Or are we talking about less, than a, less than, than a second? Just a millisecond. No second. Brandon just incriminated himself for capital murder. A defense team would argue that the surveillance footage on its own doesn't come close to proving that Brandon committed capital murder because it was abrupt and sporadic. But Brandon just admitted that he heard the officer state that he was a police officer prior to the scramble. When you, when you ran your four or five steps and he, and he got, you know, he grabbed your shoulder and he turned around, did he have time to say something to you? Did he get anything out? Did you hear him yelling at you while you were kind of taking your steps to run away? When I first ran, he said, I'm a cop. The detective knows the magnitude of that statement and immediately clarifies it to make sure there is no mistaking what was just said. Okay, so he said, I want you to step over here, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then when he turned to run, he said, I'm a cop. Okay. This now fulfills the capital murder requirement of the offender knowing that the victim was a police officer prior to the offense. Okay. And the, the blood that I'm seeing on you... It says... It says... Did you get wrestled to the ground, or did it just went from when you shot him, or what? Yeah, I think it's from when I shot him. Okay, so when you shot him, there was a mount that came back onto you. 
And then the distance that we portrayed earlier was pretty accurate distance of how far away you were. Yes, about one player, so. Yeah, so the guy that tackled you, did he say anything? Um, I think there was two or three people who tackled me, and they just said, uh, you know, just you're an idiot, and, you know, hold still and being hold still. Pain. Were you fighting still? I wasn't fighting at all. Were they telling you to hold still for any particular reason, or were they just saying it to say it? I think they were just making sure I knew. Where did the, like, I know you're saying that this is all happened really quickly, and I understand that. I mean, you turn and you shoot, and, you know, blood and the tackle. Where did the gun go? The gun, I must have dropped it right after I shot him. Do you, you know, consciously remember that, or you just believe that that's what you did? That's what I believe. Okay. Don't have it with me, so I'm not sure where it is. So you shot and then right away you tackle and something happened. And then, yeah, it was a on my face with four people on me. We're going to get somebody to come out and, you know, take some photographs. You know, obviously collect some of the evidence from your person, okay? Um, so you have a lot of blood on you, obviously, I'm talking about it. It's from the officer. We just want to make sure that we document everything, right? Is there anything else? Are you? Do you have any injuries on you? I do not. Are you injured in any way? Um, no, I've seen anything. What? No, I'm not. No, okay. And your shoe is? I'm missing that shoe. I don't know where it is, but I, I don't have the blood there either. Okay. And then the sweatshirt? So I try to ask the blood on the thing. Chase. And your pants had some? Okay. Is there anything that you want to say? Or that you want somebody to understand while we're sitting here talking? Um, I do want to say that I, that I remember parts of these stuff because I was on drugs and, and that's all I want to say. Okay. Parts and pieces are there and parts and pieces are kind of a little bit more blurry? Yeah. But the parts that we were talking about that you vividly remember, those parts, the running and the, you know, stealing the stuff and then trying to run away and the gun. Um, everything's more just blurry. Brandon is telling the truth here. A subsequent blood test showed that the level of Xanax in his system was 160 nanograms per milliliter. The therapeutic levels of Xanax is between 7 and 40 nanograms per milliliter. Anything greater than 100 nanograms per milliliter would be considered toxic and potentially fatal. Brandon had an even higher level of Xanax in his system during the crime and even during this interview. Let's just say that that amount of Xanax was extremely high. This is relevant because if you recall Brandon's letter, Xanax was the main point of discussion. Xanax is an anti-anxiety medication. If taken properly, it should decrease abnormal excitement in the brain and produce a calming effect. But Xanax has potential for addiction, and at high doses, it can have severe side effects such as memory loss, blackouts, violent behavior, and death. Xanax has been linked with numerous crimes, and no one will dispute that it is a dangerous pharmaceutical if not taken as prescribed. However, as it pertains to this specific case, Xanax isn't as relevant as Brandon's letter makes it out to be. The reality is, it doesn't matter whether Brandon was intoxicated or not. If a person voluntarily takes drugs or drinks alcohol, that does not excuse them from abiding by the law. If it did, then anyone can simply take drugs, commit any crime, and be absolved of it. The law cannot be outsmarted of such ease. Brandon took Xanax voluntarily. Remember what he admitted in the early parts of the interrogation? Was this with like a roommate or a group of people or was it just you on your own? Just me on my own. Therefore, he is responsible for everything he did while under the influence of the drug. Even if there is truth to the statements in his letter about Xanax, it is irrelevant to his case. If Brandon, for example, was prescribed Xanax by a doctor and taking it as prescribed and something like this were to occur, it would be relevant to the case. If someone gave him Xanax without him knowing, it would be relevant to the case. These are examples of involuntary intoxication. The difference between voluntary and involuntary intoxication has a history, and there are plenty of cases in the past where that distinction was made clear. 
Unfortunately for Brandon, he made this distinction simple by admitting he ingested it voluntarily, thereby taking away any leverage his future defense team may have had otherwise. They go over the details of what happened prior to the event. The detective wants to build up to eventually asking about Officer Padron again because that's the only disputable matter that can potentially refute a capital murder charge. And you got to the Walmart maybe 30, 35 minutes later. Correct, yes. And how long were you in the store? Um, 15, 20 minutes. I'm just trying to piece together the timeline, and I understand for you the time kind of seems like it's, you know, really short. Like you thought it was still 11, and it had been six hours later, so I'm just trying to piece it together. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm assuming that, you know, this happened, and then you kind of came, came down to the station real quick, right? Uh, okay. So is it possible that you were riding your bike in the middle of the night, and, and maybe not at 8, 8.30? Or in your mind, is that what it seemed like it was? This is what it seemed like it was. So okay. I can't deny it. Now. I mean, was there a bunch of traffic? Uh, medium traffic, yes. Medium traffic? Medium traffic, yes. Did you stop anywhere when you were riding around besides the Walmart? Did you stop anywhere before that? Um, I got gas, and I don't remember where the shell might have been gone from. You got gas? Okay. Yeah. Um, what were you going into the Walmart for? To get some drinks and beer. Some drinks and beer? Yeah. Like, what kind of drinks, I guess? I guess just a few of the three Coronas. How many of those have you ever picked out? Um, I don't know if I picked up any of them. Um, but I was planning on picking up two. Okay. What, what, and you said you had, you know, Walmart bags, and then you had your backpack with you. I had uh, those grocery bags where you put groceries on, mm -hmm. and then that's what I put all my stuff in to make it look like, you know, uh, just stuff that was carrying around. You put the stuff from the backpack into the grocery bags? I put uh, whatever I was going to get, like groceries. Oh, okay. So you actually did pick up some items and put them in the grocery bags, like pretending you're going to go to the counter and eat. Correct. And were you wearing your backpack just like over both shoulders at this time? Or? Yeah, I was wearing the backpack at both shoulders and then the plan was just to go into the back thing and then put them all into the backpack. And okay, what color backpack did you have? Black. Black. St. John's Military School. Oh, so it was from your school? Yes. Okay. And what kind of items did you pick up while you were shopping? Um, I'm pretty sure vegetables or portobello mushrooms. Okay. Mushrooms. Um, anything else? Um, onions, lavender peppers. Are you make an omelet? <laughs> so. um, that's pretty much what I buy every week. Oh, so. vegetable, portobello, mushrooms, onions, peppers. Um, so basically, just the, the vegetables. I mean, is there any other items? Not that I remember. Or is it yet? You had your, your sacks of uh, veggies. Yeah. And you were going to go to the Coronas? Um, I was thinking about it, but the uh, bike, you know, gets slowed down pretty heavily. So I figured. It's a smaller bike, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's a small bike, okay. just a little backpack, and any amount of weight kind of weighs you down on either side. So you're like, eh, that's it. I'm just going to deal with the vegetables for now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you, then did you end up transferring these Walmart bags into the backpack? Yes, ma'am. Wait, where did you do that in the store? Um, I found it in the aisle. I know they were sad and just put it in. Mm -hmm. okay. And then you started leaving the store? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember which exit you were trying to get out of? The exit, uh, if you're facing Walmart, to the right. To the right, okay. And where was... The, the two two people you're talking about, where were they? There was one officer and one plainclothes class profession person uh, towards the entrance, right in front of one, uh, McDonald's. Right in front of McDonald's. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you pass like, the cash registers, and then there's the McDonald's on the side, and then there's the exit doors. Yes, ma'am. Oh, so they were standing over towards the McDonald's area. 
right in front of it. Yes. So the one loss prevention guy, can you describe him? Um, uh, bulky, um, light gray shirt, probably light gray pants too. Um, uh, lighter colored brown hair. Mm -hmm. That's it. Is he white, black, he's been? Right. And the officer, can you describe him? The officer was more well built, uh, short, closely cropped, black hair. What was he wearing? Um, uh, police uniform. And just so I'm informed, the what color? Black. Black. Okay. I mean, it's just the normal one, you know, colored uniform. Yes. Did a badge. Uh, yes, no, no badge. Okay. Any kind of hat? No, no hat. No hat. Right. And just normal belt and all the normal stuff that you would see a cop wear? Yeah, the belt with the gun and, and, um, and handcuffs and things like that. That's the normal stuff. Anything unusual about the officer? Nothing I can see. You're saying he was pretty well built? Um, Not like, you know, Iron Man or anything like that, but, you know, in good shape. Yeah, yeah, skinnier than the other loss prevention. Skin. Skinnier <laughs> than bulky. Maybe because the best, or I mean, that he just both like he was in shape. Yeah. Okay. Skinnier, yes. but in shape. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Um, am I going to jail for this minute? I don't know if you're going to jail for the rest of your life. You are going to jail tonight. But I can't sit here and, you know, play judge and jury and, and tell you what's going to happen, okay? It's the record. Sure. Off the record? Off the record. Even, actually, even off the record, I, I, can't, I can't tell you because I'm not going to be the one making that decision, okay? Um, what do you think should happen to you? Um, probably be put to death. Okay. You feel you should be put to death? I killed the cop. Yes, he did. From what I understand, yes. But, I mean, it seems like you have a pretty good idea. Then you might have already been killed. You're just looking for confirmation on that? I just want to know if they killed the person. Yes. And from the injury that you're describing, from the, the, the head wound, do you feel that that's pretty accurate? There probably wouldn't have been any other option? Any particular reason you shot him in the head? Um, just a lot of drugs. Yeah, there's a lot of people who will shoot, you know, they'll just shoot somebody in the, in the chest or they'll just shoot in like the normal center. Is there any particular reason it was the head instead of the chest? Well, for that specific reason, uh, the head was. Um, in direct focus. When you pulled up the gun, it was just right in line with your eyes, with the gun in front of you. Was that what you mean by focus? That's fine. Okay. Did you think ahead of time, if I shoot somebody, I'm going to shoot them in the head? No. Brandon actually fired three shots in total. The third shot just missed the Walmart employee's head during the scuffle. I didn't want to shoot anybody. <laughs> But as we, we discussed, you know, earlier, I mean, you had the gun talk, which you normally don't do, and just in case. That's not for me. And when you were saw the officer in the loss prevention guy, you put your hand in your right pocket? Um, once they started chasing me, yes, sir. Okay. And pulled out the gun? Yes, okay. sir. But there wasn't much conversation before you kind of took off, right? The, the officer said, come, come with me. Uh, he said stop, and then he said I'm a cop. Stop, I'm a cop. Then he grabbed my arm, and uh, then I shut up. So, yeah. 
Just trying to make sure there wasn't any question of whether he was a police officer or not. Is there anything else that you can think of or anything else that you want to ask or okay. add? Uh, the next time we're going to have, like I said, we're going to have the crime scene person come in and uh, process and take your photos of you and process everything. And then, you know, from there, you'd be going, you'd be transported over to the Travis County. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But I'll be right back with you. And is there anything you need in the meantime? Any water or anything like that? Um, no, thanks. Okay. The detective executed the interrogation flawlessly. She established Brandon took the Xanax voluntarily, which refutes any possible defense of involuntary intoxication. She also confirmed on three separate occasions that Brandon knew the victim was a police officer prior to the event, which satisfies the requirements for a capital murder charge. They go through Brandon's timeline of events once again with another detective. Then, Brandon is photographed and any relevant evidence on his body is collected. The original detective gives him one final opportunity to speak his thoughts. Do you understand that a police officer being killed is going to bring a lot of emotion to the table, especially in, you know, all together in the city and with the police department, right? What we need to do is try to establish why this officer got killed. We try to make some sense of it, try to have somebody understand why, okay? And right now, what we're left is, is there's an officer who's dead for vegetables because you decided to shelter for vegetables. Okay? Do you see? I understand. You see how that would be kind of upsetting to most people? I mean, he lost his life because of part of all the and not being in the community members. Is that what it comes down to? Okay. You know why you had two kids? Two kids that don't have their father anymore because of portobello mushrooms and onions and jalapenos. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what it, see how it sounds? Somebody's son, a father, a good friend, part of a good community of police officers who's now dead because of vegetables. And we need to try to make something out of this. Right? And we need to have something come from this. And I don't know what it is. Because right now it seems pretty senseless and it seems pretty pointless. You're going from a Class C ticket that you would have gotten for shoplifting to capital murder. Do you see? See what I'm trying to wrap my brain around? Never mind, never mind yours. Never mind trying to explain this to everyone else. Trying to wrap our brains around vegetables versus a man's life. How does that make you feel? You may try to understand it, and you probably never will. But you're the only one that will okay? And I don't know how to do that. Are you okay sitting in here with that handcuff sign? You know, I've got any kind of issues. Brandon is then transported to the Travis County Jail. 
It goes without saying that abusing drugs can lead to consequences, but it's not entirely clear that drugs were the only factor in this case. Some time later, here's Brandon Daniel in jail with his fellow inmates. The TV during this time was playing footage of his case. As the other inmates applauded him for his crime, Brandon takes a bow. Then, another inmate screams, F the police, and Brandon acknowledges him by raising his fist in the air. Brandon pled not guilty to capital murder. During trial, his attorneys argued that Brandon is not guilty because he did not know the victim was a police officer due to the Xanax. This did not work, primarily because of the interrogation footage that showed Brandon knowing the victim was indeed a police officer and that he voluntarily took the Xanax. As a result, on February 21, 2014, Brandon Daniel was found guilty, beyond a reasonable doubt, of capital murder. His letter is misleading because it paints the picture that crucial details were manipulated. Here, he states that, the public opinion surrounding my case was continuously manipulated by statements released from the pharmaceutical company. In many news articles, the fact that I was even on Xanax at all is never mentioned. The public opinion, or news articles, didn't decide Brandon's fate. A jury did. And the jury was well informed of what it means to voluntarily intoxicate yourself. Brandon was highly intoxicated under the influence of Xanax. Xanax is um, a sedative hypnotic. Xanax makes you lose your memory badly. The high from Xanax would be similar to alcohol intoxication. He was on Xanax. Four bars of Xanax. The levels of Xanax in his system. Highly intoxicated. Ten Xanax. That's a massive dose of Xanax. 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 In reality, the decision of the jury was made knowing all of the information in the letter. Just because the verdict was not favorable to Brandon does not mean it was unjust. It was fascinating to go through a website that is well laid out and somehow convincing and realize it has no merit whatsoever. Brandon Daniel was sentenced to death. Would you please stand? On behalf of the citizens of the state of Texas, Brandon Daniel, the jury having found you guilty of the capital murder of Honey Patron, this court hereby sentences you to death by lethal injection. While awaiting his death at the Polensky unit in Texas, on October 30, 2021, 33-year-old Brandon Daniel was found dead in his cell. It is presumed that he took his own life because there was no evidence of foul play. Officer Jaime Padron's older brother had the opportunity to make a statement during the trial. Well, tell us about how you found out your brother. It was about 5.30 in the morning on Good Friday. And, uh, San Angelo Police Sergeant Matt Baldwin, which is a pretty good friend of his. He called me up about 5.30 in the morning and he, he could barely speak. He was having a hard time. He was crying. He told me, we need to talk. There's been an accident and we need to talk. He told me, he said, he's been shot. I'm the oldest in the family. I've had to break some bad news to my dad before. And I told him, I said, you know what? I'm going to run down there to Austin. I'm going to make sure. I'm going to go find out. Make sure he's okay. Make sure he's all right. All he told me was your brother. Son. Yes, and I'll come down and find out, make sure he's okay before I have to say anything to my mom and dad. Uh, just after that, he just he couldn't say much. And finally, he told me he's, he's dead. And that was the hardest thing. I had to break it to my mom and dad. Mom loves us very, very much, all of us. They've been very good parents to us, and they've raised a good family. taught us to respect, they've taught us to help where we can. The world turned into a very ugly place for us that day. Officer Jaime Padron was a former U.S. Marine veteran and had served with the Austin Police Department for three years. Officer Padron had also served with the San Angelo Police Department for over a decade. There is now a park in San Angelo as well as an elementary school in Austin named after him in honor of his service.